I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We are in the ninth lesson of this final quarter of 2020. The whole quarter is about education. And here on lesson nine, we have the church and education. So, I mean, obviously you've been talking about Christian education all along and you've got to figure the church's relationship to education has got to come into play. And yeah, here it's not just assumed, it's the explicit title of or the topic we're going to be diving into. So uh, this should be some good stuff, Elder Howard. What do you think? That's right. Well, the, the, the lesson really is talking about the church as a place of education. At the end of Sabbath afternoon's lesson, it just speaks to the idea of how as a place of education, the church should be a safe environment for people to come and ask questions and learn and what have you. So that's the context of our lesson this week is just understanding the the role of the church as an educator or a place of education. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a rich study. Before we do any study, however, we need to start with a word of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to study these great themes of education, redemption, and the work of the church. Help us now to not only understand it in an intellectual way, but to apply what we've learned so that every church can be that school uh, that leads people closer to Jesus. Bless our time now as we study this out, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Pastor Howard, why don't you give us the overview of where we're headed this week? Okay, our talking points for this week are as follows. Talking point number one, our mission is education, drawing from Sabbath and Sunday's lesson. Talking point number two is we educate by our lives as well as by our message. And that's drawing from Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday's lessons. And finally, number three, we receive in order to give. And that's drawing from Wednesday's lesson. So those are our talking points this week. Okay. Uh, Seems pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about that. Uh, We already mentioned it in the introduction. Maybe I should read that paragraph at the bottom of Sabbath afternoons to get us going here. Sure. It says, if the church is to be a place of education, it must provide the space for genuine dialogue to occur. Just as we were repeatedly told as students in school, there is no dumb question, we must provide within the church a safe environment for each person to grow in grace and in understanding God and his plan for their lives. So again, as you had mentioned, this this entire lesson is going to be looking at the church as a functioning as a school for all people as we grow closer to Jesus. And uh, what does that actually entail? So maybe we should go into point number one. I'm just thinking, I can't help but think about that. Anybody who's ever done any teaching has probably been disproved on that dumb question. (laughs) But the point of that is that you want people to, you don't want people to be embarrassed if they sincerely want to learn. And so we might say, modify it to say, no sincere question is a dumb yeah, question. Exactly. If you really, if you're not trying to be smart, Alecky, <laughs> and you really want to know, we want people right. to to feel that the church is a place where they're able to come and get answers. Right, in all sincerity, be able to yes. question and understand God better. Okay, church isn't for know-it-alls. <laughs> That's true. Church is not for know-it-alls. Maybe that should have been a title or something. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, but our mission is education. What do we mean by that? That was drawn from Sabbath and Sunday. Well, now in last in our last week's lesson, okay. we talked about how redemption and education are one. Yes. Our mission, in, in, in especially as Seventh-day Adventists, proclaiming the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels' messages, what is it? We're educating the world with the truth for these last days mm. and, and encouraging them to allow that truth to form the basis of their worship of the true God, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about mission, um, and again, the lesson is about the church as a place of education, what is our role if it isn't teaching people yeah. about the truth? Well, it almost makes it sound like, because you know, there in uh, how do I say this right? There are sometimes some identity crises that take place in our churches. Like, is our church just a... Uh, social club for those who have a particular doctrinal understanding, or yeah. is it a societal influencer? Are we to felt felt needs and outreach community that stuff? When the core of our calling is the teaching, the conveying of this particular present truth message. That's right. And so, if we abnegate that, if we do something other than that, um, we are not truly living up to our mission. Right. And we can talk about preaching the message, and we can talk about you know conveying the message. But we're talking about teaching. Right. And, and a part of this uh, triggered 
this thought in my mind because last Friday, last week's lesson, one of the discussion questions, the question number one from last week, not this week, was how important is the educational work for the mission of the church? And uh, my <laughs> little response is, it is the mission of the church. We're called to educate the world with the everlasting gospel. Exactly. So I just, I, I think it's important that when we talk about preaching, the purpose for preaching isn't to make us all feel better. It no. Isn't to be, <laughs> it's to communicate and teach. It's to educate. And, yes. And in several places, in fact, look in L. Wright's writings for the, for the term, in quotes, educate. Educate, educate. She yes. talks about the importance of educating people in the principles of health reform, educating people in the truths of the Bible gently and what have you. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what that's what the communication, the public preaching of the church is, mm -hmm. and the teaching and the Sabbath schools. That what Sabbath school? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sabbath I mean, ironically, school? we're sitting here talking about a Sabbath school program where we're sitting around taking this curriculum, which leads us to the textbook of Scripture. And it's to be learning, it's to be educating in the context yes. of the church. So, uh, but too many, oh, let's take Sabbath school for it. I think too many times people view Sabbath school as like, well, there's the educational work of the church. And it's a little parsley on the plate, but the real thing is the worship. Yeah. The real thing is the song yeah. service. The real thing is the preaching, inspiration or something like that. When the, the reality is the other way around. The core essence of the church is to communicate by God's grace the truth right. that he's given for us in this time. And I might dare say whether we're doing a good job of it or not, mm. in the church or in the school, you know, Sunday's lesson is true Christian education. And the point of, the, of, of Sunday's lesson is true Christian education teaches people to be like Jesus and the mission of Jesus. And, you know, uh, uh, if we're truly educating, um, uh, in fact, the lesson brings out on Sunday this encounter Jesus has with this lawyer who comes to him. Yes. What's the great commandment in the law? Mm -hmm. And when Jesus says, love the Lord your God, and he asks him, and the man says, love the Lord your God, yeah. love your neighbor as yourself, and yeah, you've spoken rightly. And Jesus said, good, do these things. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> and you'll live. And he's like, well, live, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. which, again, we're from the Old Testament law or instruction as we went over last week. Um, do these things and you will live. Well, you know, what do you say? Yeah, well, well. Yeah. No, the Bible says clearly, that, and he, comma, wanting to justify exactly himself, right. said, and who is my neighbor? Well, it was interesting, as, as I was going through this lesson, something struck me that the man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And when Jesus gave the story, he talks about this Samaritan man, the, the good Samaritan, mm -hmm. who is passed by the, by the priest and passed by by the Levite, and then the Samaritan stops. Well, this man, this lawyer, would have been more in the category of the priest or the Levite. Yes. So his question is, who is my neighbor? But at the end of the parable, Jesus doesn't say, who was the Samaritan's, or who was the Levite's neighbor? Who was the priest's neighbor? Instead, he, had, he asked, who was neighbor to the man who was by the roadside? Mm. And so it's as if he said, and I put this in the notes, Jesus' response taught that instead of waiting to discover my neighbor, I can determine my neighbor by being neighborly. Mm. In other words, this speaks to mission, like the intention of true Christian education is to teach us to educate others with the truths of the everlasting gospel. And we shouldn't just wait around and say, well, who am I going to do that to? You know? <laughs> it's like, go out and find, here's a person in need, here's a person in need. And that's mm -hmm. where Jesus was communicating that in this, uh, in this parable. Mm, there's in an fact, active element to the neighboring yes. process. It's not just a passive, like, receptive. It's a mission yeah. element. Mm -hmm. And the lesson brings that out at the end of Sunday. It says in the last paragraph, true Christian education, if nothing else, must cause us to rise above these human foibles and evils and see others as Christ sees them. Beings for whom he died, beings whose sins he bore on the cross, beings for whom he paid an infinite price. If we uplift the cross, as we must then we will see the value and worth of every human being and ideally treat them as they truly deserve in keeping with the value that God has placed on them. Mm -hmm. it's an excellent point. So the idea here is that, you know, true education is our mission to the world. Mm. Right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, what's the purpose of education in our church schools? What's the purpose of education in churches so that we can function better here? <laughs> right. And so whether it's the church school or the Sabbath school, the, the educating that we are to do is not some specialized subset of ministry that a few are called to and a little bit. 
it is the central purpose of the entire church program is to be a, a light to those around us and a neighbor to those in need, right? Right. Well, that leads us into, that light around us leads us into Monday's lesson is called to live as light. And actually key point number two, our talking point number two is we educate by our lives as well as our message. So our mission is to educate. We've talked about the three angels' messages, the truths of scripture, the everlasting gospel that we proclaim. Mm -hmm. um, but the lesson brings out on Monday this idea of called to live as light. And this first paragraph is interesting to me. It says, <laughs> Uh, in fact, why don't you read that? Yeah, the first paragraph on Monday reads, Everywhere we look, it seems as though our planet is turning in upon itself, exchanging light for darkness. Yet, we also encounter darkness much closer to home as we consider our own experience in this difficult and challenging world. For we too understand the horrors that this life brings us as we struggle with illness, as we deal with the loss of loved ones, as we watch families succumb to separation and divorce, as we struggle to make sense of many of the evil things in our society and culture. Uh, well, and obviously the, the rest of this page continues on, yes. but that introductory paragraph is, right. I think, what you were looking to focus in on. Well, you had, t you had mentioned something yeah. about the exchanging light for darkness. Yeah, that, that had... That first sentence kind of bugged me. And I think the last sentence bugged you and the first yeah. sentence bugged me. But, right, everywhere we look, it seems as though our planet is turning in and upon itself, exchanging light for darkness. And it makes it sound like, and, and accurately so, that this society as a whole, the fallen uh, results of sin that we experience, actively exchanges the goodness of God for the evil we could have around us and the, and the lies of Satan and the deceptions and the darkness, which is also a biblical term for like ignorance, right? That we, right. we don't understand. And that seems very ominous and down, which it is. But then the next sentence says, yet we also encounter darkness much closer to home. And it's like, yes. like <laughs> so like the world is dark, yet if you look closer, it's dark and we're all exchanging light for darkness and we're dwindling. And, and it kind of gives the, it's a very kind of discouraging, kind of almost morbid picture that it paints. That well, there's darkness out there. There's darkness in here. It's just nothing but darkness. And anyway. That leads, <laughs> into, that leads into a little of my frustration with the paragraph. And that is it goes on to say, you know, we understand, we too understand the horrors that this life brings as we struggle with illness, the loss of loved ones, watching families succumb to, as we struggle to make sense of the many evil things. And I just think that if a Christian can't make sense of the evil things, mm. then why be a Christian? And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying struggle to cope. Christians struggle to cope. It's hard to lose a loved one. It's hard. I'm not lessening that at any, uh, in any way. But we should know why. Yes. And, and, you know, for example, and I've included these in the outline here, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 45, that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. that, that this should not, in other words, these are the words of Jesus, it should not surprise us when rain falls on us too. Okay? Yeah. Um, Ecclesiastes says, time and chance happen to everybody. The race is not to the strong and the, mm. and the um, uh, I'm sorry, the race is not to the swift and the battle's not to the strong. You know, in other words, and, and it's in that context, he says time and chance happens to everybody. It's been said that Life is 5% what happens to you and 95% how you react to it. Everybody in the world has hard times, but the mm -hmm. Christian needs to understand that the reason God permits those, number one, we're in a great controversy. Yes. Now, again, that doesn't make it desirable. No, it's to not have fun hardship, to go through. Yeah. But we have an anchor yes. in that hardship. Yes. And part of that is in knowing that God is in control. And if he has permitted it, it's because light shines brightest in the darkness. Mm. And and for me to be a good Christian when everything's going well and I got a good job and mm -hmm. everything's everybody's healthy and all that well, what's yeah. what's to say, you know, what's the big deal? It's when people who aren't Christians see a Christian go through a difficult circumstance and bear un, bear bear under it, uh, uh, deal with it. As if they weren't going through a hard circumstance. Right. I think, what do you have that I don't have? Well, it's like the Job experience, right? Right. The, 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 the awe we have for Job isn't from the first five verses when he's no. just a good guy and he's got a great family and everything. Right, he's got it's, a lot of money. It's, exactly. And... It's after all that comes that we start to say, like, now that's a true Christian, right? And I'm, and I'm thinking of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you know, where the Apostle Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Right. So again... We're going to experience sorrow and struggle and disappointment and discouragement, but we shouldn't let that pull us down into darkness, especially not knowing why, 
right? Uh, that we have this bigger picture in mind that we need to keep uh, well, focused on. Well, my mind is drawn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Peter says, what credit is it if mm. when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? <laughs> yeah. In other words, you did something wrong and you deserve to be beaten. Yeah. But when you do good and suffer... Yes. If you take it patiently, this is commendable before God, for to this you were called. So if <laughs> I'm called as a Christian to this, it shouldn't be a surprise to me. I should yeah. be like, I don't know how to cope with this. You better know how to cope with it because you were called to it. And he says, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. And what he's trying to say there is it's our dealing with these hardships that that again, the light shines more brightly in those difficult experiences. It's our example in trial and difficulty that speak the loudest. Right, and speaking in the sense of educating others, right? That's right. Because that's the main point here that we're trying to get back to. That's what to, it means that, to live as light. Exactly, and, and the, the reason we live as light is so others can see it. So it, we can be a teaching tool right. in God's hands to teach the world if about his principles. If you're shining a flashlight on a sunny day, nobody's gonna see it. Right. It's in the darkness, and, and so living as light is especially visible in difficult times. Okay. And so we're living in difficult times now, and again, that's not belittling the difficult times, but by our faith in Christ and our hold on Him, and through His strength, we can shine as lights in the darkness. And that, that example is a winning example for those who don't know God. Amen. So... Um, we educate by our lives as well as by our message. Now, another way that lesson... Yeah, I was going to say, transition to that thought now. I think if you're going to the community idea... Yeah, yeah. another way that that happens, and, and this actually jumps all the way to Thursday's lesson, is the lesson highlights the value of community. And actually, it uses our uh, memory verse in that context to show community in the early church, which mm -hmm. I just had a struggle with that passage and seeing how that applied. Uh, to me, if I were teaching the lesson... I would go to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. It's one okay. of the best community passages. But it talks about the value of coming together, breaking bread together, and how living in um, community, like there's an education even among us that mm -hmm. as Seventh-day Adventists, when I come in and in, in, I'm community with other Seventh-day Adventists, as iron sharpens iron, one man right. sharpens the countenance. So there's a there's a strength in community for new believers to come in among fellow believers and have right. that time. That's corporate worship. That's a benefit of corporate worship and prayer meeting, which yes. is corporate worship. And Sabbath school. And Sabbath come on school, now. Um, which are all corporate worship. Right. <laughs> exactly. Well, they're corporate in the sense that they're a body. They're more than just yes. an individual. It's a gathering of people. And we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's right. And, and we t totally want to see that. Now... In our discussion, however, yes. is it possible to take this idea of community and stretch it beyond its, um, maybe its, uh, well, it's, it's hard to say you can't over community, but. But you um, can. Maybe you can. Uh, well, is, was, is it possible you can become exclusive in it and make it almost uh, an end to itself that could become a dangerous cul-de-sac? Uh, in Thursday's lesson, it mentions in the third paragraph, the first sentence says, These early believers soon discover that it is in community that the gospel can be best lived out. And I wrestled with that because the context of community was amongst like believers. And I thought, <laughs> if we always live best, best live out our faith among mm -hmm. believers, how are we ever going to reach the unbelievers? Well, so I just, even the word community, though, because sometimes it means the community, means the, yes. our neighborhood surrounding, you know, village and all that kind of stuff. Where <laughs> in this, though... The community is talking about the faith community, That's which right. we would think of as the local church setting or That's the right. or, or Adventist uh, yeah, culture. almost culture and ghettos. And yeah, <laughs> and I don't know that's the best the way healthiest to healthiest <laughs> place. Exactly. Let's see. Did Ellen White say, "Yeah, build up more of those"? Exactly. Or get Always out. build mammoth instances. No, it was never build mammoth instances. <laughs> Why don't you right? get out of Battle Creek? Why don't exactly. you get out of these places? Well, and and even back in the early church, yes, you have a you. quote from the book Acts of the Apostles. Do you have that? Yeah, today? Acts of the Apostles. Uh, she talks about, and this is in the context of page one hundred and five. Yeah, but this is the context of uh, that early church community. Exactly. And this was after the uh, uh, day of Pentecost, of course, and there were thousands of believers that continued to grow, yet the persecution was allowed to come on the church That's right. in Acts chapter 8. Why was this? And this is what we read, and this is page 105 from Acts of the Apostles. The persecution that came upon the church in Jerusalem resulted in giving a great impetus to the work of the gospel. Success had attended the ministry of the word in that place, 
and there was danger. Now, I want you to think about yes. that first. There was great <laughs> success, and as a result, there's danger. That's right. You know, th what's the danger? There was danger that the disciples would linger there too long, unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world, forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. They began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy, instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to instead those who what? Had, educating it I said, <laughs> the gospel converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it. They were in danger of taking a course that would lead all to be satisfied with what they had what what had been accomplished. Now the danger is not that the church was going to fall into Greek, uh, apostasy or grievous error or something like that, even though clearly um, uh, lethargy and apathy is a danger and is, is apostasy is a certain form of it. But the danger was they would look around and say, hey, look, we've seen members added, we've grown the church, we're, doing, we're in community, mm -hmm. and there we won. Yeah. And we're good here. When the reality is they needed to keep that communal faith sharing experience while keeping an eye on the mission of the broader community around them. And so just wanted to make sure that we're not building up the local faith community to such an extent that the goal of the church is to be a church. When That's the goal right. of the church is to live out the mission of the church. Well, I was just jotting down while listening to you here that the, the value of community uh, in that quote you read it was talking about educating within the community mm -hmm. for mission. Yes. So in other words, part of the value of community is there's education, there's training, like every church. <laughs> every church should be a <laughs> training Christian training for school. Christian yeah. workers, right? There's training in the church. There's educating in the church for mission. Yes. So um, when that's lost in the community, right. the community just becomes a, hey, we're just coming together because we all get along and we believe the same. Well, thing I remember growing up, one of the strikes against the church by the more skeptics or hardened, jaded kids was that, oh, it's just a social club. Yeah. It's just where you people get together. It's like, and we can't say like, that's now the new goal. No, it's <laughs> not right. to be that, right? We should build each other up, but for the purpose of that larger mission. Well, I have the quote in here and somebody's going to wonder where it is. So I give you you know, I, I thought this was humorous. A pastor friend of mine here in the conference told me once that uh, uh, this saying, Adventists are a lot like manure. Mm. You, pi <laughs> you pile them together, they start to stink. But if you <laughs> spread them out, they'll do a lot of good. So, <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, I'll say amen to that idea, manure quote. <laughs> but, of course the, but the idea is that of community. You, can, you know, you become stagnant. Just mm. like water becomes stagnant and starts to smell and what have you, uh, in the same way... Um, Christians aren't intended to just get together, and that's what you read happened in the early church. Mm. So community is valuable, but um, it can become a stumbling block, and that's uh, we throw that caution out. Yeah. Now, the next bullet point here that we have in our outline is in educating by our lives is the disciple is not what we do, it's what we are, it's who we are, rather. Um, Tuesday's lesson in the first paragraph makes this point if the church is serious about being a force for christian education and we've talked about education in connection with mission it is imperative that we begin with jesus jesus called disciples he trained them to do mission by walking with them jesus provided opportunity for them to be involved in the lives of the people whom they were to care for and love and i would even interject that he also told that taught them how to take advantage of the opportunities they already had besides giving them more opportunities mm -hmm. and it says daily jesus challenged them by his vision of what this world could be when people begin to treat each other as brothers and sisters so he gave them mission educated them in mission and made them his disciples. And again, a disciple is not something that they did and they clocked in for and clocked out for. Mm. It's who they became and it's who we become. Yeah. And the, 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 uh, why don't you read the quote in the middle of Tuesday's lesson from Desire sure. of Ages. The Savior's commission to the disciples includes all believers to the end of time. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. And so the sentence right before that in the lesson says, you are a disciple for life, not just for a day. This is everybody's commission, and that's what we are called to do. Mm. And then the following quote just at the bottom of Tuesdays there says, uh, from the 
it's not a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, right. just from the uh, contributors here. It says, hence all Christian education must include this sense of mission, of purpose, not just to earn a living, but to do in our own sphere what Jesus calls us to do, to follow in his footsteps of ministering to those mm -hmm. in need and to share with them the good news of the gospel. And, and that is a, is a pivotal point for churches and schools or anything That's that right. has the name of Christ as its mission statement, that we are not educating just for a self-satisfactory um, kind of uh, uh, aim or objective. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I, a respectable convention. Exactly. It, like, oh, you're now. There's <laughs> an excellent quote that I'm looking at our time. So I'm I not know we got to go. But it's in the outline, and I would certainly share it in the class. But Ellen White makes the point. She talks about something called respectable conventionality, which, when you read in the context, it just means a Christianity that looks polished and respectable, yeah. but it's lacking mission. Exactly. And that's not true Christianity. And she says actually will bring ruin to our children and mm. to ourselves. So uh, it's that whole idea of, of leaving mission out So we don't and want to, we don't want to instruct on, in that, we don't want to right. model it, and we certainly don't want our churches to become that. Yeah, we're not disciples for, li for uh, one day, we're disciples for life. All right, well, you mentioned the time and we do have to run. What is our third talking point here? Bring us bring Well, us along. we must receive in order to, be, to, to give. And drawing from Wednesday's lesson, Wednesday talks, it starts out with the importance of being teachable. It starts out with this paragraph, Albert Einstein, or the sentence, Albert Einstein, often regarded as the father of modern physics, wrote, the important thing is not to stop questioning. And he goes on, it goes on with a quote there, but the idea is, the lesson is trying to emphasize the importance of being teachable. We should mm. always realize there's more that we can learn. It, you're not going to be as effective a teacher if you think you know everything. Yes. And so there's a continual teaching and as you learn, you impart, and as you impart, you learn, which we're going to see in a little bit mm -hmm. uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy. So we must receive in order to give. Um, the Bible the, the quarterly brings out Ecclesiastes 3.11, where it talks about how the Lord has put eternity in the hearts of men, and commentators make the point that that just speaks to the desire God puts. First of all, the capacity to understand there's such a thing as a, an eternity, and a desire to know it and to attain to it. And so in every person, there's, there's mm. God puts in a desire for something better. Mm. And Ellen White says the watchword of true education is something better. And um, there's a, there's, there should be continual seeking after God. Mm -hmm. if we are, and that doesn't go for the student. That goes for the teacher as well. Right. At the same time, we don't want to get caught up in the whole like, well, I don't know anything, because, right. so let's just be open to everything. Uh, because... There's, there's this balance between seeking and It was Pastor Richard O'Phil who used to say, you know, it's important to be open-minded, but don't be so open-minded your brain falls out. <laughs> so okay. there, there's got to come a point where you 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 have learned something. Right. You know, it's like, yes, always be questioning, but at the same time you can't be like, well, I really just don't know. There's got right. to, How do I teach? How does anybody teach if you never right. come to a conclusion of anything? Right. So you don't want to be a know-it-all for sure, but you don't want to be a know-it-none either. That's right? right. So there's a, there is this balance, right, between confidence that we have and curiosity for what we still don't yet grasp, That's right? That's right. Um, and, you know, you've got several passages in here, and I think you're important, like, for instance, in Acts chapter 17, verse 21, when the, the those at the Areopagus, right, they were always wanting to know some, hear or hear some new thing, right? right? The Greek philosophers, they were always learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth, which is what Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy Right, because, and by the way, in that context, he's talking about because they want to do what they want to do, so they want to hear a thing, mm -hmm. but they want to do their own thing, yeah. and then they can never figure out what the truth is. Right. Uh, what are the odds? And where Jesus says, you shall know the truth, right. and the truth will sh set you free, right? Right. Um, you shall know the truth. Now, you're yes. not always going to be grasping and never getting anything. Exactly. So there comes a point where there is something gained. <laughs> Amen. So we want to be curious and at the same time confident in what the Lord has shown us, knowing that there's still an eternity to go. That's right. And the best way to gain that is as we share, as we impart, imparting as we receive. And it's great. It's put, it's put very well in this Desire of Ages quote, page 370. says, the most intelligent, the most spiritually minded can bestow only as they receive. Of themselves, they can supply nothing for the needs of the soul. We can impart only that which we receive from Christ, and we can receive only as we impart to others. As we continue imparting, we continue to receive, and the more we impart, the more we shall receive. Thus, mm -hmm. we may be constantly believing, trusting, receiving, and imparting. 
Beautiful. Well, thank you for that inspiring way to close that down. Hopefully all of us can learn those lessons and uh, share in our upcoming Sabbath school classes. But for today, let's bow our heads for a word of yes. prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sharing with us all that we need uh, for redemption and for at the same time giving us the responsibility of sharing with others what they need for redemption as well. Help us to always be receiving and imparting as you have designed for we pray it in Jesus' name.